Welcome back to a special edition of the Legal Weekly Wine. Today we are talking about the 4th of July because it is happy 4th of July to everyone. Um, we are truly going to talk about, I think, the, the Declaration, maybe the Constitution, certainly Thomas Jefferson, and maybe a few other things along the way. I am Virginia Tarani. I am with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer tell you do. And I am joined again by Dr. John Vile from Middle Tennessee State University. He is the Dean of the Honors College, and he has been a continuing pleasurable guest that we've had on the Legal Weekly Wine. And because he is such an expert in, goodness, everything, the, the Founding Fathers, the Declaration, the Constitutional Convention, and all of the American symbols, the American Constitution, the amending process. We are so pleased, Dr. Vile, to have you here to give us this special edition about all things the Declaration and 4th of July. So welcome. Thank you. I know that was an awfully long introduction, but you have so many things to say about you and your expertise and your experience in education. Well, I, got, I had the opportunity of going to both the institution that Thomas Je Mr. Jefferson attended and the one that he founded. So, yes. <laughs> and he attended, so everyone knows, he attended William and Mary. Is that correct? That is right. And he was a law student there. I don't Maybe. know. If, well, he studied law under George With, who was the first designated law professor in the United States, but whether he did it on campus or whether he did it at his office or house, I'm not quite sure. Interesting. Well, it's hard to know, especially at that time, we don't, we didn't have law schools like we do now. That's right. L literally, I believe With was the first person designated as a professor of law in the United States. And James Wilson may have been the second, you may not quote me on that, but uh, future Supreme up. Court Justice, uh, I believe at University of Pennsylvania, or, or what is today University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Had a name then. And we both went to William and Mary. You went to yes, we William and Mary for undergraduate, is that correct? That's right. And I went there for law school. So we were both Marshall uh, Witt. Marshall Witt School <laughs> of Law, yes. And then you went on from there to get a PhD from the University of Virginia. That's right. And that's why I have to call him Mr. Jefferson. Oh, why? <laughs> that's the tradition at UVA. It's always, you always speak as though he's about ready. He's either in the room or about ready to enter the room. Oh, that's so funny. And, he's, and you don't call the campus, the campus, you call it the grounds. Oh. There are other little traditions too. Oh, well, that, that sounds awfully fine and dignified and refined. Well, <laughs> students didn't always act that way, but yes, <laughs> nor did they in Mr. Jefferson's time, I might add. Uh, one, of the, one of the great trials of his latter life was trying to keep, a, keep the kibosh on some of the student activities on campus. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay. Um, that, that's great. And then you have your PhD in political science from UVA. Actually in government. We use oh. the old term. Yes. Okay. Both I'm learning undergraduate so Undergraduate and, and PhD are called government. So. Okay. Well, what we have then is, like I said, what, what seems to be an amazing special here today. Happy 4th of July. Yes. And we are going to celebrate, you know, right? Woo you don't have a kazoo or <laughs> fireworks or something. You don't have some popcorn you can put in the background and <laughs> some confetti, some sparklers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no fireworks. Any kind of fireworks are actually banned in my county, um, which is well, too bad. They're, they're bound. They are banned in our town as well, mm -hmm. except for three days. But usually the fireworks begin about a month early and continue at least a week after. So um, my wife was complaining about it the other day. And I said, if you were a police officer with all the things that need to be done, would you be going after someone setting off firecrackers? And we both agreed there were probably better things to worry about. <laughs> right. Probably not high on the priority list. <laughs> probably not. All right. Well, in honor 
of today, because it's the Legal Weekly Wine, we have to do some wine, or at least I do. You, I believe, are still drinking your water. Is this yes <laughs> trusty water bottle today? Um, I have got, um, I've brought with me another wine from Williamsburg. Um, since we're talking about the founding um, and our illustrious fathers, as well as the declaration, I think it's appropriate to go back to Williamsburg and everything that it means for our government. And I have probably my favorite wine, um, which is, is hard to do. I mean, I guess everybody has a favorite and this is my favorite. It's from the Williamsburg winery and it is the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I, I have loved this wine since I started law school and I'm afraid to say the day, but I get, or the year, but it's 2002. Um, we went and did a tour at the winery And ever since then, it has been my trusty standby. And I was pleased to pick some up when you and I were back there in April. So Mm -hmm. we're going to do the Cabernet. Um, I am so sorry that you, let's see, there we go. You do not get to join me in it, but cheers and happy fourth. It's, it's full-bodied, um, a very full-bodied wine. For those of you who don't like what I would call, what I layperson call thicker wine, then it is not for you, but it's got such a smooth finish, um, deep plum and red cherry type of flavors, and it's absolutely delightful. So anyway, cheers. Go to Williamsburg, grab your favorite wine, and join us today for happy hour. Grab your glass of wine and let's go. What would you like to start with? Because the floor is yours. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the background. Um, Everybody knows that the 13 colonies, although not all originally founded by the English, eventually came under English control. Okay, now let's, just, just so you know, you say everybody knows, but let's assume everybody does not know. Um, we certainly do, and especially you. But anyway, so English control, 13 colonies, continue. Okay. Um, and England exercised what is sometimes known as salutary neglect. Salutary means beneficial, mm. which is to say because it was 3,000 miles away, um, they had a governor on site, but the governor, you know, there's often transitions between governors and some, in, in any event, because they were so far away, the British for, on many matters left the colonies control themselves. Mm. Uh, 1619, um, Virginia has its, sets up its own house of burgesses, which would be sort of its equivalent of the English parliament. Now, is um, that in Williamsburg? Is that where they set it up with the governor's palace? I believe, actually, it started in Jamestown, which okay. is where they originally settled. And then Williamsburg became the capital and then Richmond. There, there's a there's a trend in almost all the early states where the capital would move closer to the center of the state mm. the longer it became a state, or at least during the first 50 years or so. Okay. Uh, and so you have a progression from Jamestown, Williamsburg to Richmond, which is fairly centrally located uh, within Virginia, pr- particularly when when the, when West Virginia was part of it. Um, but in any event, in what's known to us usually as the French and Indian War, sometimes called the Seven Years' War, uh, there was a major conflict, really almost worldwide, at least between the colonies of France to our north, which would be Canada today, right, and England. And at the end of this controversy in which the English prevailed, and in which, as a consequence, Canada was ceded to back or ceded to the English, or, uh, fell out of French control, uh, At the end of that, the British had spent a fair amount of money uh, trying to defeat the French. And from their perspective, they were protecting us. Now, from our perspective, maybe we had been dragged into their war. But from their perspective, uh, they had sent a lot of troops here, spent a lot of money. 
now, you know, a lot of colonial blood had been shed, too. Mm. Uh, you may, may, may know that George Washington, you know, was on the famed trip with uh, General Cornwallis when he was killed. I don't uh, think but, I did know that. Oh, yeah, that Washington actually established his reputation uh, in the French and Indian War. Uh, so oh, it gave, gave, him some, gave him some practice. But in any event, at the end of the war, Parliament said, you know, we're we're getting some fine trade with the colonies and we got a place to send our criminals <laughs> if we need it <laughs> in Georgia. I'm thinking particularly, <laughs> you, you know, we got a place for 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 people who want to leave England to go and remain British uh, part of part of the British Empire. But the, the colonies need to pay their due. And so they began enacting a whole series of taxes, which we learn about in grade school, you know, mm-hmm. the tea tax, the sugar tax, the towns and duties, uh, the intolerable acts, so, or what we call the intolerable acts, and so forth and so on. And pretty much from the beginning, the colonists said, you don't have the right to tax us. Mm. And they did so. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me. When we think of a constitution, we think of a single written document. Right. British don't have a single written document as a constitution, but they have many landmarks along the way that include written documents, one of which is the Magna Carta. Uh, I think so highly of it that uh, my wife and I went to England in, 12, in 2015 uh, in order to celebrate the 800th birthday. Is that uh, why you went? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and we got to see what I what I believe to be the first display ever of the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the U.S. Constitution in one place. Wow. Um, in any see, event. I thought you had just gone to visit England since you'd never well, been we, before. Well, we hadn't been, and that was a reason, but the reason we chose... 2015 was because it was the 800th anniversary. At least that was my my reason. Of course. Uh, Linda now, may have been <laughs> <laughs> I think she, she may, may have been have. there for another reason. I don't know. Now, I have to also tell on you, because we're talking about your, your visits and your timing, um, you're so involved and excited about and interested in the founding that the year you got married was 76. That's right. And we really wanted to have, we wanted to get married on the 4th, but there were so many activities. It was the 250th anniversary. See, there we go. That's I'm, what I'm it was. sorry. I'm sorry. It was the bicentennial, the 200th 200. anniversary. We're three years we're getting ready for the sesterocentennial. This was the bicentennial. But there were so many activities that we were afraid it would just dis- disaccommodate too many people to try to do it that weekend. So we did it the weekend before. So, uh, and, and congratulations. It, happy anniversary, by the way, because that you, was yes. so recent. Yes, it was. But, um, but you spent part of your honeymoon enjoying bicentennial activities. Um, we went to... Tyrone Palace, if I remember, in North Carolina, and we went to Duke University. Uh, all the things one would typically do on a honeymoon. You at uh, least got to Bush you know, Gardens. We did go to Bush Gardens. <laughs> yes, we did. In, in Williamsburg. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't till till you and your sister got married and began taking vacations at uh, beaches that I realize that most people do not visit historic sites and presidents' houses on vacation. <laughs> uh, no, most people do not. They really don't. <laughs> they really miss out, you know. They get sunburn, and I get historical knowledge. The how there were event. only so many. Okay, so I, so you know, and our listeners and and watchers can can know. Um, Doctor Vial is my father, um, and and I was I. I am very blessed to have you as a father. And we did we did learn so much growing up that most children probably did not get to experience. And I realize that now. But as a 10 and 12-year-old, I was like, it's just another house. It's it's a house. Well, we visited with rooms. how many blocks? 
<laughs> Remember, we went to four, three or four different years visiting rocks. <laughs> it was about five years. That's right. We we moved from houses to include famous rocks. Um, so yes. we would go and include different rocks, including the Natural Bridge and Plymouth Mount Rock, Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. Yep. So we we had some famous rocks along the way, all historically related. I had to stop anyway, you for that. Anyway, I, go I'm ahead. I'm afraid. Uh, uh, it has the statute of limitations run out? I'm so afraid somebody's <laughs> going to hear this and they're going to get us for child abuse. <laughs> That's right. Somebody call it in. <laughs> Although, remember, we had, we had a friend who would take his children to dams. Yes. Yes. And then, and then subject visitors to pictures about Hoover Dam and whatever. After yeah. I learned that, I was like, whew, I'm a lucky girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> it could have been In worse. In any event, are we going to tell the story of the American founding or yes, not? Yes, please continue. <laughs> okay. So at the end of the French and Indian War, Parliament begins enacting taxes. The colonists say Magna Carta of 1215 sets forth the principle easily summarized as no taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. We are not represented in Parliament, so Parliament has no right to taxes. And there, there is actually a, a fundamental logic behind that, which is we hope that when our Congress adopts a law, it's adopting laws that apply to themselves. Right. So they actually, and, and even if it didn't directly apply to them, it at least applies to other people in their district and they can see how it's working out. And so the colonists said it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong for this. And so they denied what's known as parliamentary sovereignty. Mm. Uh, in English law, at least in theory, parliament is able to do anything that is not impossible to be performed. Americans said, we don't accept British, par British parliamentary sovereignty, but they said, we're loyal. We, we, do ex we do count on our rights of British mm -hmm. citizens. That's why we're counting. That's why we're citing the Magna Carta. Right. And our tie to England is not through parliament, but it's through the king. The king, by the way, had on, in many colonies had signed or issued the charters, which were a kind of primitive constitution sort of agreement. And which king was in place at the time? King George III. Okay. Um, and the colonies, I would say, even, even after fighting broke out in 1775, April of 1775, in Lexington and Concord between the British and the Americans, even after America had the uh, Continental Congress had appointed George Washington as the commander of American forces, there were still many, I think, who thought that reconciliation was possible. Mm. If if the English king will simply, you know, we're going to send petitions to the king. Uh, he likes us. We like him. He's going to straighten this out. Now, whether he actually had the power, you know, 100 years earlier, he might have been able to do it. At this time, parliamentary sovereignty was so well established, I'm not sure he could have really resisted parliament. But right. the short of it is that in January of 1776, Thomas Paine, who is a recent immigrant from Britain, writes a, writes a book called Common Sense. And by the way, it's one of the best sellers of, of the day, probably over 100,000 copies. He did At not that take time. That at that time, and he did not take, he did not get royalties for it. Uh, he considered it his gift to the nation. Wow. And in this book, he basically s associated kingship with everything that was wrong. Mm. Uh, kings lead to wars, kings lead to oppression, kings lead to higher taxes. And he was particularly uh, opposed to hereditary succession. You know, why Why should we be stuck with the firstborn son mm. of the past king until we know what his character is, what his abilities are, whether he's prudent or not? Right. And in, in this common sense, he urged for independence. He also argued that it was absurd for an island to be governing a continent uh, that was 3,000 miles away. 
And this does so seem to didn't know at the time how large the continent was. Well, he probably had a bigger idea than we would think that he did. I mean, he he was he was certainly aware that there was a large stretch to the west and probably went to the Pacific. But but in in, in any case, uh, even the thirteen column, you know, Britain could probably fit easily in the Virginia of that time, which, you know, as we mentioned earlier, then included what's what's today is West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Maybe the same would be true of Georgia or Pennsylvania. So he basically sort of opened the door for people to reconsider, do we want to be loyal to the king? And as the colonies sent petitions to the king that on at least one occasion, he refused even uh, to read, mm. Uh, they began to think we, you know, we need to do something for, we need to declare independence. So in May of 1776, the Second Continental Congress recommended that states begin adopting their own state constitutions. And on, in June of, uh, of 1776, um, so I'm trying to get a specific date here. Um, that was May 10th. Right, June seventh of seventeen seventy. Well, let's go back earlier. In, in June seventeen seventy six, George Mason, uh, who was a prominent Virginia planter, a neighbor of George Washington, introduced what is known as the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and it's important because much of the language will later be reflected in the Declaration. And, okay. and the Declaration of Rights says all men are by nature equally free and independent have certain inherent rights of which when they enter to the state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely, and here you'll hear a close parallel, the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. And who uh, wrote that? That's George Mason. Okay. Uh, and I have a book, by the way, on George Mason. Uh, somewhere on my shelf, but in any event. All right, but that's, uh, you wrote a biography on George Mason. Well, I wrote a book basically trying to contend that although, like I'm doing now, we primarily remember Mason for authoring the Virginia Declaration of Rights, that he wrote very a, a lot of other important things and had, had a major influence. But in any case, he, he wrote that in June, and that same month, Richard Henry Lee, who was a Virginia delegate, introduced a resolution, actually introduced three resolutions. One was that the colonies should consider forming a formal confederation so that they could oppose Britain. Secondly, that they would go get foreign allies because Britain, after all, was you know the, 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 the world's largest or most powerful country at the time. And then finally, that they should uh, they should declare themselves to be free and independent states. Okay. And to that end, Congress uh, did what uh, bodies often do today. They appointed a committee, uh, five delegates, uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman. Uh, and the we person don't hear who, much about Livingston and Sherman. Well, Sherman, we ought to hear more about. His, Sherman was a very, very, would be a very powerful figure at the Constitutional Convention, and in fact, some people, in some ways, he may be one of the most underrated people who was at the convention. Uh, very austere, always dressed in black. Mm. Uh, it was Je Mr. Jefferson once said that Sherman had never, never said a silly thing in his entire life, that his whole life, you know, started out as a cobbler, had become a judge, uh, done all kinds of things. Oh, that's funny. Um, but in terms of the declaration, most of the work was done by Mr. Jefferson. Uh, there's some evidence that Adams and Franklin did a little bit of editing. And then the document was sent to the Second Continental Congress. And here we know that Jefferson was in absolute agony uh, because they debated it basically line by line. Uh, and he was just going nuts. And in fact, <laughs> he would later he would later send copies of his original declaration as opposed to the one uh, that the Congress had had edited. What did uh, he think was different or wrong with it? Well, most of us prefer our own language. Mm. Um, some of the things were actually, it's probably good that they did. 
make changes. One was he had this long, uh, and part of it ends up in the Declaration of Independence, but he had this long uh, section opposing the king for bringing slaves to the New World, uh, which, you know, fine, does that mean you're going to free the slaves? No. Um, so that was that was part of it. Congress adds, by the way, a number of references to the uh, to uh, to God. Mm. Uh, Jefferson had one. I, I believe Jefferson had actually said that all men were created equal. So that's sort of an indirect reference to God. But the the Continental Congress added some additional ones there. They took out, you know, the what we forget about the most people don't know how the Declaration is organized. Yeah, we, I mean, we focus on the Constitution and the Declaration. We know so fairly well, we, little we, about. We, we quote we quote one paragraph, right? Mm. We quote the paragraph that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right, but that's about uh, all that we remember. Right, and that's that's pretty much the first paragraph. And, and by the way, one of the fascinating things about it, if you compare it back to what I just read from Mason, the, the traditional trio was life, liberty, and property. And Mason did Oops. life, liberty, property, and happiness. And Jefferson leaves out property, uh, and I'm, you know, there's still, I think he would have assumed that the right to property was part of, particularly as a, as a, as a plantation owner, was certainly part of what he considered to be happiness, mm. but it was, con, it was, it was broader than the term property itself. Um, but in any event, the, the way the document is laid out is, you know, your opening paragraph, which in some ways was inessential, well, didn't get to the direct arguments of the uh, of the colonies at the time, except I guess if you say you know all men are created equal, then maybe that means the colonists are equal to those in Britain. If they get representation, we ought to get representation. But you have this you know this statement which has become something of an American creed. Um, you know what what do we stand for? Well, now have we lived up to it? Not very well sometimes, but. You know, at least in theory, we we say that all that all are created equal, that all have equal rights. Uh, one question, of course, is you know why does he say all men? Uh, the obvious is that women at the time didn't have the right to vote. On the other hand, the word men was sometimes used as we would use the word mankind or humankind. Um, certainly, Mr. Jefferson recognized that women were were human beings. Uh, he was not he was not particularly progressive when it came to giving women uh, voting rights or, or something like that. Well, they also did they have property rights at the time? Um, they did if they were not married and they didn't have fathers. <laughs> the, okay. the doctor, well, and I'm not an expert on this, but there was a doctrine of coverture, which is that when when a woman got married, then uh, unless there were you know, sometimes they could they could draw up what we would call a prenup, but sometimes there could be like an agreement as to how property was divided between them. But typically, the husband, you know, the actions of the husband were regarded as both those of the husband and the wife. So right. women had had limited rights at the time. Uh, and by the way, in in 1848, when <clears throat> women and others met at the Seneca Falls Convention, they drafted their uh, their concerns in the form of the Declaration of Independence. So it began that all men and women are created equal. Uh, oh, it actually did include that. Oh, well, in 1848, they're, okay. they're redrafting of, in other words, they, and, and this, is, this is not uncommon to, you know, other people have used the same format. You know, it's not, it's not a bad little template to use, um, but most of the declaration, you know, that's the part we quote. Most of the declaration is something you'd be more familiar with maybe than most people. It's basically an indictment. Mm. It's a list of, you know, it would make any prosecutor proud. Here are the 25 uh, things that we have against King George III. Um, I, and I would the, be. Right. <laughs> it's like, wow, how nicely way, done. <laughs> 
Right. And, and, and all of these begin with he has. He is an indirect reference to the brood of England, <laughs> King George III. As the um, figure had. Yeah. Right. As they get to the last five, he says he has combined with others. This is his way of indicting Parliament without actually having to, to use the name, which would suggest that Parliament had some kind of legitimacy. Okay. So he has, the king has done this, and then he has combined with others. And then he ends with various, what we would call war crimes or war atrocities that had occurred since the fighting had begun in, 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 in the beginning of April. And then, you know, I said that we don't, we don't have a lot of, most of us, the, the words we know are typically from the first paragraph, but many people also know the, the ending for the support of this declaration with re firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to our to to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yeah. And there have been a number of books on writers of the Declaration of Independence. In fact, I have one that deals with uh, Benjamin Rush and the, the the portraits that he did of various individuals when when he was at the Second Continental Congress. Um, and I think I just lost my train of thought. Right, M many of these books have emphasized that when people sign the declaration, and I want to go back, right, when they sign, they were, in the eyes of Britain, committing an act of treason for which they could be hanged. Okay. And so um, Franklin reputedly said when they were signing that we must either uh, hang together or we must hang separately. But I do want to go back a little bit to talk about chronology, because yeah. I've mentioned that I've mentioned the um, Payne's publication in January. I've mentioned the call for state constitutions in May, Richard Henry, Res Henry Lee's resolutions in June. And then July 2nd is actually the day. And this, those, this is part of the teaser that, that we was asked. That the for. teaser. Okay. July 2nd is actually the day that the Continental Congress voted to declare independence from England. And we have, we have from, I believe his diary, John Adams, who was a mm -hmm. major colossus in, you know, getting uh, America to declare its independence uh, he was always jealous, by the way, of Mr. Jefferson, because Jefferson comes in at the last, you know, sometimes shows that the pen is is mightier than the sword. You know, Adams serves on hundreds, scores of committees. He does all this work. And then the last minute, Thomas Jefferson comes in and steals the glory by writing the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> the showman but, comes in. Well, although for many years, people did not know who the author of the declaration was. So I'm not sure that, I mean, the delegates knew, but it wasn't, it wasn't, he was signed as one of 56 delegates. He wasn't, the John Hancock's the one whose big signature as, you know, chair of the, of the Continental Congress gets the attention. So but why are okay. we, okay, I'm okay. getting ahead of us. So okay. that's so, on July 2nd. Right, but uh, let me finish. So, <laughs> Adams writes in his diary that this day will always be remembered as, you know, we're going to have bonfires, we're going to have fireworks, we're going to have celebrations because we've oh. declared independence. And two days later, the Continental Congress finally says we're adopting the Declaration of Independence to explain to a watching world what we're doing and hopefully to make a convincing enough case that France and Spain and some of these other powers will join us. Okay. So it becomes the day. It, it becomes, the, and, and there's some indication, by the way, that the next July, it, it may have partly been the next July, it's about July 2nd, maybe, when somebody says, you know, we ought to do something. It's been a whole year. And then they said, well, okay, 4th is coming up. <laughs> and oh, that's so, so funny. Yeah. So anyway, July 4th is the day that we celebrate. Uh, our independence. That is and, fascinating. Right. Now, how did that, and for the first hundred years, 
See, now you listen to podcasts, right? <laughs> right, which you we're pretend, on. <laughs> right. Or you pretend to listen to, co- you know, you say, oh, did you see that, you know, wacky professor uh, talk about the Declaration of Independence? But in the early years, you wouldn't have a discussion. You would get a speech. And chances are it would last two or three hours and it would be published. In and the often heat. They, off in the heat, oh. uh, often, by the way, they were given by ministers rather than professors uh, or people who had been. At, and, and so there's a long history. There are probably thousands of Fourth of July speeches that have been given in history. Oh, wow. I, I gave one last week uh, in preparation for uh, for Fourth of July. But. 50 years to the date after the Declaration of Independence is adopted, two people die. Um, 50 years, were, right? 50, 50 years. Okay. July 4th, 1826. The two people who, you know, the one who had the greatest influence in writing the Declaration, the one who had the greatest influence probably in getting it adopted. So mm. Jefferson and Adams one in Massachusetts, one in Virginia, simultaneous, or not simultaneously, but they both died the same day. And when this is publicized, now there were different interpretations, but the most prominent interpretation was, you know, God had allowed both of these men to live to 50 years, and this was a sign. Uh, Five years later, uh, James Monroe dies on the same day. Mm. By the way, Madison died in in late June, if I remember. In any event, of, of when which he was, year? Uh, 1831, I believe. But Is you better it the not. same year that Jefferson and Adams died or a different no, year? No, 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 no. No, they die in 1826. Madison, I believe, is 31, but you better not quote me on that. Okay. No, uh, no, I'm sorry. Monroe is 31. He's five five years later. I'm embarrassed because I am James Madison, as you know. And I should. You I know do. I would. I know I was born in 1751, and I know I lived. <laughs> I know I was the last person at the Constitutional Convention to die. But I, for some reason, I can't remember. Maybe it was too traumatic that I can't remember the specific year. But <laughs> I do remember <laughs> that my doctor said, "Would you like us to give you, you know, some?" some of that wine from Williamsburg that we think we could keep you alive till the fourth. And he said, no, I'm out of here. (laughs) That's so funny. And and so everyone Uh, will know um, you do what you're referring to is you actually do a reenactment as James Madison. I do. And it's uh, the, the, the older I get and the more, the more weight that I gain, the less credible it becomes. Madison was only about 90 to 100 pounds. Oh, my goodness. I did not oh, know yes. that. And in fact, at James Madison University for a time, uh, they had one of their women students who actually portrayed James Madison and apparently did it in a fairly effective uh, fashion. Oh, wow. Uh, in in well, any event, yours is so interesting and so fun. You actually dress up. You have the wig, um, and and yeah, you do have a, so many facts that yeah, you, you know, portray the sad in an interesting thing was, way. I've never really gotten. If maybe some of your listeners will take pity on me and find a decent wig, I've never <laughs> found one that, that I really like. The first one that I wore was really awful. And so I did it on stage in, in a college in Louisiana, and they had really big lights on. And by the end, I looked more like Albert Einstein than I did James <laughs> Madison. <laughs> but in any event. Can't you get one from Williamsburg? Don't they have a wig I, shop? I'm sure they do. And I haven't, I just have not, have not done it. But All right. in any Well, event. we're going to go back. We'll get you a wig. We'll get some more wine. And... <laughs> Okay. We'll take care now, of you. Now, we, did, we had another teaser, though, last week. Yes. There's one president who was born on the 4th of July, and that was Calvin Coolidge, who, of course, is an tw- early 20th century president. Um, so, an important date. Yes, very important date. I'm so sorry you weren't born on the 4th of July. I, I am too. What were what were my parents thinking? You know? I, I don't know. They really should have planned better. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, goodness. Okay, so that's how we we come to have the Declaration and our 4th of July. It is. And the, I guess the one thing that sometimes people don't understand about the Declaration, and I've actually... I've done a book on the Declaration, but I've, I've actually done more book, more work on the Constitution. Sometimes people think that the Declaration, I mean, in a sense, it created the new nation by declaring its independence. Mm. But the structure of our government was first expounded in what was known as the Articles of Confederation, which is a loose, a loose confederation that was done during the time of the American Revolution. So after the Declaration. After the Declaration, it was, well, it was, Congress proposed it in 1777. It wasn't actually ratified by the 13th state until 1781. That that document, there's general consensus, did not, well, provided too much state power as opposed to without Congress, for example, didn't have the power over interstate commerce. Oh. Uh, it didn't have the power directly to tax individuals or to conscript them. It had to do that through state, you know, making requests to the state. So 1787, the U.S. Constitution is drawn up, and that's where we get, you know, the division of government into three branches, uh, the a bicameral rather than a unicameral, two, two house versus one house, uh, Congress, our Supreme Court, and most of the other institutions that we have today. So when was the presidency established? Well, that that was established right. in, under the Articles of Confederation. <clears throat> there was essentially only one permanent branch of government, and that was the legislative branch. And the Congress was unicameral, so it was one house. Each state had a single vote. Mm. And you find that reflected, by the way. So one of the problems with creating a new constitution was states did not want to give up their equality. And so when you have the Congress that's established under the new constitution, the compromise, which is, by the way, an undemocratic aspect of our constitution, doesn't necessarily mean it's unwise, but it's undemocratic. Each state has equal representation in the Senate, no matter what its population. So Rhode Island and California, the, the populations and size vary tremendously, both have uh, two senators. Okay. And that is, I mean, it's it's undemocratic in, in the sense that it's not, well, the House of Representatives, by contrast, you can have from one representative all the way up to, I think California has, I believe, more than 40, maybe even oh, more than wow. 50. But, you know, it's based on population. Okay. Wow. All right. So, but so, okay. So to finalize that thought, when did Washington become our president? Well, okay. Right. So there was, there, there were committees in Congress that when Congress wasn't meeting, you would have, I believe a guy named Hansen was officially the first president of the United States, but it wasn't, he was, it was more like a prime minister. He, he wasn't, he, it wasn't a separate branch. Mm. It was simply the existing Congress. So okay. the Constitution is written in 1787. Most of it goes into effect in 1789. That's when Mr. Washington is inaugurated as the first president. So the presidency is a creation, not of the Declaration, but of the Constitution. And one of the things, you know, in giving the speech last week, I, I tried to surmise what would the framers think if they could come back today? Um, and I'd, one, one of my fantasies is that if this ever happened, I want to be the first person to drive Thomas Jefferson, you know, in a car or, you know, show him a television or, you know, some, some of these things that I think he would have just loved. You know, you know, at the Constitutional Convention, they actually took a, an afternoon off to go down to the riverside and watch steamboats. Oh. Uh, and this was a, you think of just the big innovation that that would have been uh, from people who would have to paddle their way, you know, prior to prior to this time. But one of the things that I mentioned was, you know, there, there's sort of an irony in that both liberals and conservatives, they won't say this, 
but they both want they both want a strong president when their person is in office. Um, and some of the powers that we have given the presidency are equal to, if not greater than, some of the powers that George the Third had. And oh, interesting. I, I, I think that you know, in some ways, some of the framers might come back and say, "I thought I thought we got rid of a monarch." Now, president is subject to election; he's not hereditary. Um, you know, there are other controls, but. You know, if you just watch the reaction to this year's Supreme Court decisions, uh, they're almost too predictable. So, you know, you have a president who tries to erase four hundred billion dollars worth of loans, the debt, and and Democrats who had opposed what they thought was improper power by Trump say, "Well, of course he can do that." Mm. Uh, so even today, it's very hard sometimes to to separate us. To look at the larger issue rather than do I want the president today to be able to do what I want him to do or do I not want him to be able to do what what I want him to do? Right. Now, that that's a, a great description of where we are. It that's is. And it'd be a good segue, I think, probably to uh, the next um uh, Yes. Law Unscripted? The, the, yes. So the next Weekly Wine, which is hosted by the Law Unscripted, which is its own company now. Um, so, yes, what we're going to do is so that's the end and an amazing of the amazing special edition of the Weekly Wine. And then on Friday of this week, grab another glass of wine and let's do happy hour. Um, us as well as as our listeners who can discuss the next hottest topic of the, I think, two biggest Supreme Court decisions from last week. We we discussed affirmative action last time, as well as the religious freedoms regarding the postal worker. Um, and then this week, we are going to talk <laughs> about the wedding case regarding LGBTQ rights as well and first amendment rights okay uh, yes. we're, we're going to do it balanced <laughs> yes and first amendment rights yes. so we're going to we're going to talk about that as well as the student debt case um so or student loan which i call debt <laughs> student loan case so with that we will see you back on friday for happy hour and in the meantime have a wonderful 4th of july